As Bob said, uh, we have two, there are two parts to our talk. I'll give the first part today, and Steve, who sits here, will give the second part tomo tomorrow. Uh, we give it together uh, because we worked on it together for many years, in the early 70s, in the early 70s uh, for about two dec decades or so. Okay, now before we start, we'd like to, ga to gauge how much you, uh, your knowledge of the internet. So here is a surprise quiz. The question is, in the IPv4, yeah, what does V4 indicate? You have time to think about it until the end of the class. The uh, grades will not be given uh, Okay, the purpose, the purpose of the talk, or why we like to, to give it, is because I, voice over IP became very, very, very popular uh, and practically replaced the old telephony. And as a business, it is, it is a, a, over a billion dollars a year. For those of you who don't remember what a billion is, it's like giga. So it's a giga, giga buck business uh, by now. And not only that it is big, it is also growing awfully fast. And those are, so here are quotes, um, quotes from the trade uh, ma magazine, the trade pu publications. You can see number like 30 billion and 33% per, per year and 40% per year. And, More and more, uh, in 2008, there were 106 million residential VOIP in the country, and the rate just goes up and up. You know. We have a diagram for that called Moore's Law for voice over IP. Uh, anything you measure, the, it, it, expone it grows exponentially. Of that, and you can get lots of data from IDC. Reported. What I want to show next is a their very, very beginning. This is, is a request uh, to start a new program. The request for from the ARPA IPT, IPT stands for Information Processing Technology or Technique. And the, the director of ARPA IPT sent this letter to the headquarters of ARPA, which at the time used to be ARPA and later it changed to DARPA and later it changed to ARPA. And now it is DARPA for the second time and God knows for, for how long. And here the computer of office, which is, was called IPT, sent this memo to the director asking to start a program in computer networks. The purpose for which the ARPANET was built was for resource sharing. And I'd like to read you some of that. Uh, this is from the same memo, the objective of the program. So this is what made the ARPANET uh, happen. Two more uh, uh, slides from the same document, which was written in, in June 68. And please try to remember this date. Those are, those are the milestones. So the first one today going RFP to a contract is a matter of years. Urban technology of uh, DOD and the government. Time to get more communication lines. If this is a budget. Four years, most of the money goes to communication line. Some of it went to went to the east. It just happened that with those numbers, that was exactly a million dollar. So I think this is the answer to why 19. If it was 20, it would be million and 50. 
Okay, this is a, the, the, what, what I showed before was a timeline of the ARPANET as predicted. This is a timeline of the voice activity. It go, we have to really to start from 1962 when packet switching was invented by Lenny Kleinrock at MIT in his PhD dissertation. Lenny invented, <clears throat> Lenny invented packet switching, and packet switching is more than, than saying what routers are. Packet switching uh, is to do with <clears throat> packet switching has to do with, with all the issues like buffering and bandwidth and, uh, and lots of problems that we learned through, through then. It was, a paper, it was a dissertation that Lenny Kleinrock worked on with an office mate of him by the name of Larry Roberts. They were both students at MIT in the same room. Yeah. And Lenny which was not a great pro programmer as Larry was, needed lots of help, so Larry helped him. And La Larry, go Larry learned about packet switching when, they when he was a student from, from Lenny. And uh, when the ARPANET started, the first problem was, will it really work as predicted? So the first thing that ARPA, ARPA did was to bring the first imp to UCLA and call and establish a network measurement center. <clears throat> In this center, they could verify the theory against reality. And it turns out that rea the reality was not very much different than what was predicted. Okay, seven years later, Larry was at ARPA in position to start doing it. Larry started start, uh, start by writing this memo that I show you to his management and asking a million dollars for a network. In retrospect, it was probably one of the best, million, best spent million dollars of the, of the government. Okay, 1969 was born. In 73, they have a crazy idea, which use packet speech for voice, for telephony. Anyone who knew anything about telephony could explain why it was impossible, including Bell Lab and AT&T. In order to, start, to, start, to follow this idea, which was, came from Bob Kahn, who was program manager at the ARPA at the time, they initiated the NSC program. NSC stands for Network Secure Communication. The idea was that if we can do it digitally, then we can secure. At that time, encryption was very complicated, and this simplifies it a lot. By the end of 73, we had a network voice protocol running on the ARPANET. Seventy-four, we had several compression techniques like CVSD and LPC. By the end of seventy-four, the Surf and Can paper came out. This is a paper that defined TCP or, defi or defined the internet. Seventy-five, we demonstrated the voice message system. In, in seventy-six, we had teleconferencing, which we in 77, Bellab, or and again, of Bellab, issued a patent on packet, packet speech. Yeah. We thought it was a bit funny that we were already demonstrating it publicly for three or four years. They invented it uh, later. VIP was split in 70. IP was split from TCP in 78, we defined UDP uh, in order to demonstrate it to other people. We shot a movie of it and then the network voice protocol had to be redefined to, uh, to run over IP. 
then in 1995, the Terem Voigt Orchestra. Anyone knows, please let me know. I notice it. Defined. 73 to 95 is like 22 years after we was demonstrated voice over IP was was coined and it is in wide use. Uh, yeah. RTP for real time protocol was, was specified later as an RFC and IETF will start working on you know, on things <laughs> Protocol that Steve uh, spearheaded in through IETF. The crazy idea of ARPA was to get real-time voice, and real-time real-time voice is different than FTP. We knew how to do FTP. We knew how to send email, but real-time voice is very very different. One of the more interesting thing was that the carriers, AT&T and all the baby bells, did not realize that it was competing with them. So they totally ignored it. Even what they called packet was very different from what we called packet. The objective of the NEC was to prove, was to do proof of concept for the feasibility of packet switching network for interactive communication among people. Now, when you say interactive communication among people, people should be able to, to understand every word, recognize the speaker, and maybe even better, like saying he's mad, he's angry, he's happy, whatever. It turned out that there is lots of information carried beyond just understanding the, the words. It, it, those, those were the explicit objective of the project. In addition, there are lots of implicit objective, like what high quality, high quality meaning that you by the people, real time, the conferencing, yeah voicemail and interoperability with the telephone network. All of that were obviously requirement that were unfortunately were not written any place, but it was obvious that we have to do that. We had to, to compress this, to compress the, the speech a lot. And the reason is that the network that we had at the time had 50 kilobit lines. And there were only three of them across the country. Because there, were so, there was so, much, so little bandwidth across the country, we could not devote 64 kilobit to each telephone call, because this is what the telephone company does, 64 kilobit per second. So we obviously could not do it. So we had to do lots of work to reduce the amount of bits that have to be transmitted for each telephone call. And speech, the speech comparison turned out to be much more complicated than what we, what we thought. People were working on it for, from the 60s and the 70s. And so we, we use compression that was developed by, by some people on our project and some people before. The amount of, the, in order to do real-time uh, vo voice compression, we needed the equivalent of a Cray at the time. It was a supercomputer job. And later, there were, there were several other array processors, small computers, with performance of a super, of supercomputer with less, much less memory optimized for very specific tasks. Those were SPS 41. 
this is a great machine, the first of them a, a bit less than the challenge was to reduce 64 bit per second to 2.4 kilobit per second about factor of 30 and do it in real time. This is a picture of, of an F, FPS. So the dome is a ray processing. And it, it was a super duper machine because it could do 12 megaflops per second. Uh, and uh, some, some of you probably still remember when computers were that slow. A little about the ARPANET. Every, in every site of the ARPANET there was an imp, which is great invention of Wes Clark. Uh, the original design of the ARPANET uh, was that there were host computers and would be wires between the host computers. So every host computer needed another interface, and they were all different, and it was really complicated. And Wes Clark suggested to have a machine that we called the IMP later that would be exactly the same every place except the local interface to the host computers. So all the IMPs talk to each other uh, exactly the same way. It simplified to no end. Yeah. The IMPs were interconnected to each other by 50 kilobit lines, which built three or three modems. That on the other side it was digital at 50 kilobit per second, and the other side was a bunch of several analog telephone lines. I forgot, I think they used six or something like that. And it was practically uh, custom made for each uh, site. The design called to, uh, the design was very, very forward looking. They, under, they understood that it would be many computers. So therefore they left six And this really uh, was a traffic which was one in each uh, one in each site. And uh, being forward looking, they also thought that in each site they may have maybe three computers, but what the heck, they gave it two bits. So the addressing on the ARPANET was a total of eight bits. And two for the host. 20 years later or so later when it was two bits, factor of four. And you all know what happened later. About 20 or 30 years later, IPv6 replacing IPv4 with 128. So you can see this progression. Uh, more laws for addresses. Uh, so we have three data data points and six predicted point, and I'm sure that you will keep going. Longer and longer messages. Uh, we are going to 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 talk. To talk uh, to talk mainly about the communication aspect of the project and not on the speech compression. However, those interested in the speech compression came out by Robert Gray, who is a professor of signal processing at Stanford. And the book is called Linear, Linear Predictive Coding and the Internet Protocol. It's an inter interesting book. We highly recommend. Recommend that way. It, it looks at Amazon. It, through Amazon, it looks slightly different.
Okay, this is what an imp looks like. Since imp was bought by ARPA, and since ARPA is part of DOD, it was pro procured according to the way DOD procures things. So there are mil spec that the imp had to pass. Including dropping it from, I think, four feet or something like that. And, and, and proving that it can survive nuclear war. You know, operators, the people may melt, but the computer will, will keep working. Here in 1969, December 69, Ar ARPANET. Uh, if you remember, the milestone called for a operation in December 69. So this is practically on target. Now, this is chosen because it has lots of things that are interesting for routing. Because it has a, the, the circle of three, they check lots of al algorithms. including uh, multiple... So this, when UCLA was a network, uh, network measurement center, and every few years UCLA celebrates the birthday of the, of the Internet, and, the, and the, the birth is considered when the first imp came to UCLA. People in the East Coast don't like it, and there are lots of arguments about it. In June 74, there were more hosts. After a while, it became impossible to draw those, uh, those maps. NCP was a network control protocol. Totally new animal for for every for everyone. Uh, there was there was no IP, no TCP, no UDP. The NCP did what this protocol did la did later. The NCP made sure that every bit, the, the integrity of the messages that were delivered, uh, it did not allow for errors, flow control, overflow covered from errors by using retransmission. Act, if, if it wasn't act in time, it was considered lost and resent with a checksum. And bad messages never made it. So the, the protocol it was defined in BBNN report number 1822, which was the Bible for the early, early work on the ARPANET. No control, and in, in everything was okay. The, The type of service that you could get was what everyone wanted, reliable, error-free, in-order delivery. Reliable meant it, it checks up correctly, error-free is obvious. In-order was important because the messages, separate messages, arrive at different times and messages could pass each other and arrive in change orders. The job of the NCP was to make sure that it was in order without, without errors. No one wants uh, erroneous data, and no one wants to lose data. And this was the only type of service that was offered. Problem was for everyone. But for us, it wasn't good enough for real time speed. Way NCP achieved reliability and error-free error was 
by, uh, by repeat, repeating and resending and retransmitting archives properly. Because it caused large delays. So then we got this idea that there were three important properties. The other is low latency, and the third is data integrity. If you do FTP, which was what most of us did, you need both data integrity and high bandwidth. If you did Telnet, which was interactive uh, communication, you need data integrity and low latency. But, but we, in real time speech, we needed both high bandwidth and low latency and we did not mind to lose on the integrity. Very important to understand that real-time communication is different than non-real-time communication. It took us a while to get it. Real-time communication, new data, obsolete previous data. Problem is that you have buffer overflow. The host did not take all the packets from the buffers and the communication lines bring you more data. And so you have to discard some of the data. And the question, do you discard the latest packets or the oldest packets? The answer is, it also took us a while to realize that if it is real-time communication, you discard the old packet and keep the new packet. For if it is non-real-time communication, you keep the old packet and discard the new packet. And the, for, for example, if you have weather forecast, I need, to, I need now the forecast for now, and I don't mind if I lost the forecast for yesterday. It's FTP of programs. I need the, the beginning of the program. We cannot come without it. Example of real time, another real-time protocol that was done in 1971. It was real-time flight simulation where the pilot Pilot was, the pilot was at Harvard, and the computing was at MIT. And the, the pilot has a little joystick and some other, other devices like a throttle. And he had a screen on which he saw the outside view. And that's mainly what the pilot got. In order to run it at Harvard, the heavy computers being at MIT, packetized the data, send it, gave it to our imp, that gave it to the BBN imp on the other side of town, that gave it to the MIT imp on the other side of Cambridge. And PDP-6 was, uh, computed the dynamics of the plane, and the LDS-1, line drawing system one of Evan Sutherland, computed in real time the view at the time was something like a few hundred lines, pixels, no area, no shading, no color. But it taught us a lot about issues in real time. And when Bob Kahn saw it, he said, that's exactly what I need for voice. Beginning, but later we did. The flight simulator taught us about delay and jitter. Delay is bad, but jitter is worse. Jitter is a variance of delay. Better to drop packets than to times and retrieve times when you want the latest information. The other thing that we noticed that we have to think not only about bit error rate, but about packet error rate. The problem is not that the bit is bad, the packet is bad. And a packet can be bad, 
because one, pay, one beat is bad or all of them. So, because it's so expensive to retrieve, we invented another way to communicate, which was When I showed it before, there was only one A for application on the left side of the, of the slide. Now we have NVP, the network voice protocol was added. To it. Both of them went through the NCP, except that the NCP did not give us the performance that we needed. What we did here on the right side was bypass. Data that went through the end, uh, bypass did not go through the NCP imp. And the, the receiving imp looked at it, had no idea if there were lost messages, had no idea if there were errors, just gave it to the application on the other, other side and let, and let NVP decide how to handle it. the mode of operation which was called type 3 of type 3 we were allowed to bypass the NCP when we did it the BBNN who controlled the network operation was afraid to let us do it because they thought that if we don't use the NCP we may overflow the imp driver and bring the network down some work to convince them not to worry about it. This is the structure of the NVP. Talks to the imp driver on that side. On the other side, there is a user with user interface. So there is a control protocol that does see that establish the connection, ring the phone, answer or Most important, it handles the data. The data protocol could be one of several, like for example, LPC and CVD that I mentioned before, and PVP for video, and PCM and Delta PCM, and there are a list of about 20 or 30 different vocoders in existing today. And part of the NVP's network voice protocol was to, was to agree on which vocoding uh, to use. So as an extension, we, we defined the NVCP, which was conferencing, and PVP, which was video, video, packet video. There were on the market several comp uh, video compression machines. None of them was Decades, all of them were working with stream of bits. Several issues that we have to address about it. Example of uh, what speech storage, like answering machine, like to do it, and uh, lots of lots of bits. So we had to to send it to a machine. online so, write a write was so expensive and so unbelievable so ARPA could do it only in one place the problem was that we, messages may be very long like say 60 seconds around 60 seconds one message Oh nine, I called Best Buy. They told me that 500 gigabyte cost $75. I really should have called again and find out how much it costs now, but bet not more. Am 
חי כעודו עולם. או 2.7 מייקרו דולר, we were going cross country in the past. Today, today, voice is considered free. The internet was born in 1984. The internet way of doing it, not O of N square. The way, thing, the way most people did it before in the, in the past was connecting each computer to each computer, which is N square operation and N square software and N square interfaces. Instead, we do it in N interfaces. Once you do it for any computer type, you can replicate it. That's basically the idea of the internet, ON rather than ON square. That we had to replace the ARPA's NCP with TCP. I think TCP is what makes the internet work. One of 83, the end of NCP, long live TCP. E and the move from, from the original operation for seems now very fast in comparison to the move to V6, but I know we'll get there one day. What do the operation with TCP is we can talk to applications like uh, into the imp, into other application, and get everything work together nicely. The type of services that we got was exactly what everyone wanted, reliable error free in order delivery. One want errors in data, and no one want to lose data, and there was no need for anything else. And again, as before, that was passed for, for the time. So UDP was added later. How does to do? In UDP. On the on the right side, which was TCP version 1, 2, or 3. Right side is TCP version 4. that only handle applications that don't need real time. If you want to bypass TCP, you have to use UDP. And UDP is for real time. So this is what we called earlier the split of TCP. And, and this is an, an, an IPv4. The V4 indicated this version 4 of TCP, not of IP. It was never IP3. Everyone who had this answer get two points. P that was invented to be for everything that doesn't want TCP. Says that oh, mo most, if most bits on the internet of, of real time in movies, I yeah, use, you, you, use you one way or another. And uh, when uh, we got interested in the history, we decided the best place to look for the history of voice over IP was in Google. So we googled voice over IP, and this is what we... What so if you look at uh, other places on, the, on, on using Google, you find out that this is that uh, packet voice was invented 
several times independently, including AT&T in 1977, which was Not that uh, too bad, but next generation will know that, will know what is in Google rather than what really happened. Words about IP, and this is the other IP, the IP that lawyers like, the intellectual property. What we found that nowadays in the 2000s, companies sue for infringement that occurred in the 90s upon patents that were issued in the 80s about work that we did in the 70s. And the work that we did was de developed and funded by ARPA and put in the public domain. It bugs me personally to see how many patents are on voice over IP nowadays and how much money is spent on lawyers around it. Voice over IP and packet video are a major component of the Internet or the information revolution or the communication revolution. They were developed and demonstrated publicly by ARPA in the 70s. Advances in computing, communication, and storage made it practical and ubiquitous. Carrier don't think that we are crazy. The carrier are, conver are converging with us. End of part one. Tomorrow, same place. We will uh, show you a movie to demonstrate. PSD teleconference that we did in September. Also discuss the evolution of voice protocol, packet switching network, like voice over IP and like Skype, which bypass the entire standard telephone network long distance toll system. Questions, comments? Excellent, excellent question. If you note, oh, I'm sorry, the question was, when we did it in the 70s, it was unbelievably impractical. And we need supercomputers and we need memory that didn't exist. And the question was, what made us do it? Is it that we foresee the future or some other belief? Yeah. That's the question? That's the question. Okay. The, the thing is that the purpose of the NSC was to prove uh, proof of concept. And it was obvious to people at ARPA, it wasn't obvious to me, but it was obvious to people at ARPA, especially to Bob Kahn, that computers will be cheap enough to, to, to do this thing. So if you notice, there was a big gap between when we finished working, doing our stuff in mid-80s, and until late 90s when it started being picked up by industry. And, what, and the hibernation was, called, was for us waiting for the price to be right. And I'm glad that Apple did not try to, to work on it, but let industry get it by itself. In the, I, don't, I, don't, I think it started around the 70s. And, and I'm not sure if the satellite TASI was all digital. They used TASI time assigned something. I'm sorry, TASI, I don't remember. Yeah, they have speech detection, detection, and they were doing all kind of interesting things for satellites. And inside the network, I think T1 was starting being digital. It took a long time for all T1s to be digital and all T0s to be digital. Yes, what Steve said, it was not available as a, service, as a, as a standard uh, offering. To get it, like getting the line between the EMS was a special uh, project.
I'm uh, Steve Kastner. I'm giving the second half of this talk. Danny Cohen gave the first half yesterday. His part concentrated on the uh, initiation of the ARPANET, the building of the ARPANET, and more on the concepts involved in getting packet audio and video to work initially in our, our experiments. My talk is going to be more about the protocol development, both the roots of it in the work we did in the 70s and then continuing on into uh, the real-time transport protocol that is uh, in use today. So the, the timeline for this work uh, began in the 70s. The ARPANET began at the end of, uh, of the 60s, 1969. But the, the work we did with packet audio and video together at ISI and with other contractors around the ARPANET was in the late 70s and early 80s. This development of the coding algorithms, CVSD and LPC, plus development of the protocols to support transport of that data across the network. We covered both the uh, real-time transport and uh, voice messaging, and we did not just point-to-point -point calls, but also conferencing with, with multiple sites. And uh, the talk today will include a movie of, that we shot in 1978 showing a demonstration of the conferencing. Continuing from the, in the 70s, in, in 1978 was when TCP, the original TCP, was split into IP and TCP. And from that point, we began to use really what was voice over IP, um, even though it was not until a couple of decades later that the term voice over IP was coined. We developed network voice protocol running over IP. We uh, began then a, a process to standardize the, uh, the voice protocols working towards RTP in 1992. And uh, then those specifications in later years were taken up for uh, parts of a complete system to make voice over IP. One thing I wanted to point on this timeline is a gap between 1981 and 1992, and I'll uh, make a point of that on a later slide. I'm talking about conferencing that began on the ARPANET. The ARPANET had a fairly simple protocol stack compared to what we see today in, in current protocols and current networking. Um, the IMP, Interface Message Processor of the ARPANET, was the packet switching node. It was involved not, with just, not only with forwarding packets the way that we do between uh, IP routers today, but also in some of the flow control. It worked together with the network um, control protocol in the, uh, in the host itself. So this box at the top represents a host, and the, the box at the bottom is the IMP, the network node. That network control protocol is the rough equivalent of today's TCP. Uh, at, as I say, at that time there was no IP. This was before IP and TCP were developed, uh, specified, in, uh, or uh, initially, initially described in 1974. The service provided by NCP was one of a uh, reliable byte stream or reliable data stream. Um, it handled flow control so that the network nodes would not be overloaded. It handled a retransmission when necessary for covering, recovering from packets that were lost. And uh, basically, as I say, provided a reliable communication path. So the, the service that was provided was, and, and for those of you who heard yesterday, I am intentionally repeating a little bit of Danny's talk as a, as a precursor to the movie. The, the service that was provided, as I say, was a reliable transmission service uh, because, as we all know, nobody would want uh, errors to occur in their data. Nobody would want their, their data to be lost. But, of course, that's not true for audio transmission, for interactive audio. It's more important that the delay be low than that all bits get there because you can actually recover from some amount of packet loss 
uh, especially when the, the losses are of short duration by bridging the gap. There's a lot of redundancy in the audio sound that you can afford to lose some. So what we had to do in the ARPANET case was to bypass the NCP, bypass the, the reliable transmission mechanisms, and instead go directly to the uh, directly to the imp with a, a different form of the packets. As I said, the imps were providing part of the flow control mechanism in conjunction with NCP and the host. So we needed to use the, a type 3 packet, which was sent without flow control through the ARPANET nodes. Uh, as Danny mentioned yesterday, the the BBN Network Operations Center was reluctant to let anyone use that mode of transmission because they were concerned that we could just overload the packets which is in the network, cause buffers to fill up, and cause the thing to collapse. So it did take a while um, arranging for a specific experiment to be done on Tuesday at 3 o'clock, and we could send some packets to eventually they became comfortable with the, that notion. Today, we have a high volume of uh, of audio and video traffic going along with all the other kinds of traffic we have on the internet, and it's uh, it's become more or less routine. It's, it, individual streams are no longer such a big part of the capacity of a, a circuit, typically. So in that picture I was showing our network voice protocol connecting directly to the imp driver and the packets which is in the network. The network voice protocol is comprised of a couple of pieces, a data pro protocol and a control protocol. And that separation of data and control is something that we see in, in many areas. It was an important aspect of this protocol design as well, because there's really different requirements for the data transmission and the controls that go along with it. Also, in this slide, I'm talking about different forms of voice coding going over the data protocol, LPC and CBSD, and I'll talk a little more about those in a moment. But also note here PVP, which was the video extension following roughly the same data protocol but extended to carry video packets. And over here on the control side, NVCP, which was our extension for conferencing. So those two are described here. The the control protocol for NVCP included a floor control mechanism handing off the floor to allow different people to speak as opposed to just a shared floor. And I'll say a little more about why we needed that in a moment. Um, it provided some ancillary control functions like voting, and you'll see that demonstrated in the movie as well. And uh, I mentioned that we were doing, in addition to real-time transmission of the voice, we were storing some of it for voice messaging. Um, that was uh, in conjunction with uh, text messaging at the time. The, on the video side, we did use the, the PVP for multimedia teleconferencing support. Actually, we had uh, some a few rooms set up like this one and used the packet network in the early 80s for that kind of function. Um, the, the, the video has a few differences in characteristic from the audio, but basically the data protocol accommodates both of those. Uh, at that time, we didn't, we didn't consider storing video on disks because we didn't have anywhere near the space that, uh, that is now just everywhere for uh, for individuals to store, as well as massive storage like Google has, of course. So to introduce the, the movie, what we'll see in the movie is this scenario with four sites. What's shown here is at each site a voice terminal, that's what VT stands for, with a CBSD encoder. And you'll see those boxes in the movie, the boxes with blue sides. You'll see various. Uh, user interfaces uh, being employed for uh, controlling the, the conference and the voice uh, floor switching. 
Um, this movie's on YouTube, but now I'll play it for you live here. All of the voices in this film will be heard as they would to a conference participant. They have been digitally processed to reduce the amount of data which is transmitted by a factor of more than 20. It will sound like this. here, but they're familiar with the project. Oh, uh, it looks like someone's trying to call in. It looks like it's Parker from Salt Lake City. Let's see what he has to say. Hello, Randy? I'm anxious to hear what Drew's group has found. Well, they're on and can hear you. All we need now is Danny. We haven't heard from him. I don't know where he is. Oh, you know, it's Thursday. I'll bet he's sailing. Hills Rolls Royce. You are now connected with the IFI Alphanet Digital Voice Conferencing System. Here's Danny now. Randy, sorry I'm late. Are the others still on? Yes, they're all here and can hear you. In fact, Parker would like to verify your number. Do you have your data with you? No, I don't have the exact numbers with me. I could talk now in round terms if you'd like. Danny, Blue seems to be wanting to speak. I'd like to check that with Parker first, and then I will give Drew the floor. Drew, Randy wants to hear from Parker about what I just said. Then he'll give you the floor. Sorry. Parker, I hope it's finished. Thanks. Yes, we're just typing it in. You can expect a message from us this afternoon. Drew, you can have the floor. Randy, I think it's impossible for us to build a program around general numbers. We really need Danny's exact figures before we can continue this. I'd rather talk when he has them. What does anyone else think? Well, let's take a tally. Can we reconvene this call tomorrow, same time? Okay, Parker, we really don't need you anyway. Drew, can you have all of your team members on hand at that time? Danny, let's be on time tomorrow. Fine, we can all make it. We should be able to get this finished tomorrow. Now remember, Danny, you have to be on an ARPANET phone so we can secure the conference. This was a hypothetical conference using features of two real systems developed at the USC Information Sciences Institute.
so there's a, a few things that uh, uh, I'd like to point out uh, from the movie. Um, one is you may have noticed some occasional screeches, uh, in particular in Randy Cole's voice. Um, so I actually believe that uh, we, we, when we made the movie, we recorded the audio and then uh, transcribed it into the encoded form for demonstration before putting it, printing it on the film. And we printed the film with a couple of different encodings. I believe this one is actually the LPC encoding because that, that screeching is a nature of LPC. The way the LPC algorithm works is it, it produces a, it, it's based on a vocal track model. So it tries at the analyzer to pick out what the timing is between pitch pulses. And if it gets confused by a factor of two, the pitch can be off by a factor of two. So it, it analyzes what the pitch pulses are. And then at the synthesizer, it produces pulses at that rate and feeds them to a filter that models the vocal tract to try to reproduce the sound. That's how we get down to the 2.4 kilobit uh, data rate. Uh, so the, the CVSD that we mentioned there is a much simpler algorithm. It's kind of interesting. CVSD stands for Continuously Variable Slope Delta Modulation. And basically what it is is it tries to track the audio waveform simply by saying at each sample time, is the next one higher or lower? So it tries to drive one bit at a time up or down the, the track. That has a different kind of artifact. It sounds kind of gravelly. You may have noticed, for those of you who heard Danny talk yesterday, you may have noticed that his voice sounded a bit different in the film. In fact, it was uh, felt that Danny's voice would be too hard for people to understand, so Eric Mader was speaking for Danny instead. Um, I wanted to point out the, the various user interface devices that we developed, some from a, a character-based terminal, some from a little box that we built, and some from the telephone, which we felt was an important aspect of making this system usable for a larger number of people to have the telephone interfacing. And you did notice the, the voting that we could do on the side carrying control traffic, which was sort of independent of the voice traffic. That's what this picture shows, uh, the solid lines indicating the voice data flow and the dashed lines indicating the, the control flow. In this particular implementation of conferencing, there was strict explicit floor control. Only one person can talk at a time. So the, the chairman could talk at any time in the reverse channel to, the, to whichever participant had the floor. And the person who had the floor was talking to everyone else. That's what the arrows, the solid arrows up there are trying to, uh, to show. The reasons for this form of, of strict control were that the ARPANET the lines of the ARPANET are only 50 kilobits per second. So we didn't have enough bandwidth to send many streams of audio. Furthermore, the, the LPC encoding, because it's a vocal tract model, can't track multiple voices at the same time. It just doesn't work. It doesn't fit the model. So we can't have the sound all go to one place, get mixed together, and then sent as LPC uh, as is done currently with many centralized conferencing systems. So there's a number of reasons, um, bandwidth and encoding technology. Later on, when we, when we were running, as I said, uh, conferences in the early 80s, we did have systems that could handle the mixing. And we sent um, the data streams from all sites to all other sites at the same time. Also, in this uh, movie, you saw an example of telephone interfaced audio. And as I said, we felt that was an important aspect of the project. Um, we had a couple of generations of it. What was shown in this movie in the 1978 time frame was a single unit that we had uh, built at ISI. Um, but the later one, the STNI that I'm talking about here, uh, was a single card. I'll show in a moment how that was used. Um, both of them, though, supported DTMF signaling so that you could push touch tone buttons on the phone and have that be decoded as a signal input. And the, uh, the going in the other direction was used for placing a call across the network and dialing out on the other side uh, to do toll bypass, for example. So 
as I say, this was 1978, and note the similarity to uh, what we have with Skype and other systems today. So this little box up here in the upper right-hand corner is a Lincoln Packet Voice Terminal, PVT, which was comprised of several circuit boards, wire-wrapped circuit boards plugged in there, and a telephone that interfaced to the unit. Uh, that telephone actually uh, has a, a thicker cord than normal and has a microprocessor inside it, so you, you can't see that from just the picture. But this was, um, this was a system capable of doing voice uh, compression inside the little box instead of with a whole rack of equipment like you saw in the picture from Danny yesterday. Um, and it communicated over a low bandwidth, low cost version of Ethernet, CSMA CD bus network called the LexNet. The STNI was one of the cards that could plug into this uh, slot there, so we developed that at ISI. The, uh, the, the, uh, in 1982, at the end of the network speech compression NSC project, we had a, a big demo meeting uh, at Lincoln Laboratory, and there we had a, an actual five-site conference with uh, multiple networks involved. Uh, at SRI, there was a packet radio network. At ISI, we had the STNI going to a telephone network. At Lincoln Laboratory, I think there was another STNI as well as a local terminal and DCEC in, in Washington. So we actually had, did have a, uh, we had several conferences similar to this simulated one, but this one in particular pulled all those pieces together. This is a, you probably can't read all the details of this, but this is a, a diagram of what the network was like at that time. The, the oval at the top is the wideband network, wideband satellite network, with uh, a, an amazing three megabits per second capacity compared to the 50 kilobits per second we had on the ARPANET. So that allowed us to do multiple channels of audio, uh, multiple conferences and connections at the same time. It also allowed us to begin doing packet video uh, because we had enough bandwidth. At the various sites, we had voice terminals of different kinds, uh, some on the packet radio network, the STNI, as I mentioned, at ISI, several at, at Lincoln, and also at Lincoln Laboratory, they had an interface, again, a telephony interface, but this one based on uh, a channel bank for uh, that you would have like in a central switching office. So a bunch of phones could come into that and get connected through uh, a higher speed interconnect, T1 speed interconnect into the packet system. So I mentioned the gap in the timeline at the beginning of the talk, roughly a decade from 1982 to 1992, where there was uh, I mean, you would wonder why didn't we have this system that we had built commercialized and, and why wasn't it deployed more widely? And really the answer is we had to wait for technology to come along and, and be ready to support this kind of application. Both reduction in cost and increase in capability to get it down to a reasonable size. Um, the, the thing that happened by the 1992 time frame was the development of workstations, like a Sun workstation, that's what I had at the time, and the implementation of audio devices in those workstations. So then we had, sitting in front of people, in the equipment they would already have available to them to use, we would have the, the voice terminal capability ready to go. During that decade, we weren't all sleeping, we were uh, developing, continuing to develop the protocols, and as I mentioned, extending from just doing packet audio to doing packet video as well. Um, there was a, there were a couple of networks built up that supported that research work. The the DartNet was a, a T1 based cross country network. So then instead of having to deal with the satellite delay of the the wideband satellite network, we had uh, just local terrestrial delays. The packet voice and video system was used for conferences by, by people who weren't involved in the project. So it was actually tested to, 
to see that it really works. Uh, when you develop something new today, you have to actually get it out into the, the field so that <clears throat> you can uh, make sure that it really works the way you intended. And we did the same. We, we didn't really have enough, um, enough capacity to offer service um, to the general public, but there were a number of uh, research groups that, that did use the system. Um, there was also a transition, uh, a buildup of the IP multicast capability uh, to allow multi-site conferencing over the internet. And uh, I'll talk more about that in a minute too. Uh, and, and then, as I said, the, initially the, the notion of sending packet audio or video over the network was a strain on the network. But as the network grew and as uh, the research work covered the needs of different kinds of transport and how to handle that, how to manage that within the network, then the network became ready for this kind of service. <clears throat> Backing up slightly, I mentioned on the timeline that the split of, of uh, IP out of TCP occurred in 1978. Um, Similar to, the, to what I talked about with the NCP and the ARPANET protocols initially, TCP originally provided just a reliable transport service with retransmission. We had the same problem in wanting to apply the network voice protocol over IP, we need, uh, over, over the internet. We needed to have the reliability mechanisms separated from the packet forwarding mechanisms. And so, in fact, in 1978, uh, IP was extracted from TCP and became a separate protocol. Um, so that uh, an interesting factoid that Danny pointed out yesterday is that there is no IP version 1, for example. A lot of people may not realize that because it didn't exist really until version 4 of TCP uh, where IPv4 was split out. Also, at the, at, the, at the end of that hibernation decade, 1992 was when we began work in IETF on, in the audio video transport working group that I chaired at that time uh, for the development of real-time transport protocol. How many of you folks work with packet audio or video and, and perhaps with RTP in particular? At least, at least one. Um, the, uh, the, the remainder of this talk is largely about the development of that, uh, the protocol. But um, I mention here that the, this was the first IETF audio cast. What we had done was take our, uh, our Dartnet T1-based network that was providing uh, research basis for not only voice work but other aspects of, uh, of networking. Um, we use that as a core for adding on tunnels to do IP multicast to other sites. We had uh, 20 sites spanning 16 time zones from Australia to Sweden, and we actually did have real-time audio inbo inbound and outbound from the IETF meeting at that meeting. Uh, ben Jacobson, I recall, talking in the, uh, in the plenary at the end of the meeting, and it was it was quite impressive to, to hear him coming from a remote location over the internet as it was. Um, that it, after, after that initial meeting, the, the ad hoc creation of tunnels that we had done became a little more permanent in something we called the M-bone, the multicast backbone. Uh, again, this was just an overlay network on top of the IP network, which did not at that time support any IP multicast natively. So the, the IP multicast routers were workstations, which then encapsulated the traffic and sent it across, um, encapsulated IP and IP multicast in IP and then sent it across through the point-to-point the -point routing. It actually grew uh, through 94, 95 to, uh, to something of this size, where we had 20 countries and 900,000 nodes, and uh, then at each of those places a, a number of uh, 
a number of users hooked up that could listen. So we had at later IETF meetings uh, something like, I think, um, a maximum of 500 people who had tuned in to one meeting. A couple of highlights of our use of the M-Bone were the NASA Hubble Space Mission. The NASA TV video got coupled in and broadcast across this network. It was, I remember sitting at my workstation and doing my work and having over on my second monitor a, a video of the Hubble repair going on, being able to listen to the, uh, the times when they're, the part they don't show and the little clip on the TV news um, was really neat. And another, uh, another event was the broadcast of the Rolling Stones concert. Um, and that led actually to a, an article about the M-Bone in uh, Newsweek in December 1994. The uh, distributed music performance was a demonstration of some of the work we had done more on the research side for synchronization of audio and video. That was actually uh, a live performance with, with live, uh, live players, one on keyboard, and um, I forget what the other instrument was. Um, at, uh, at ACM Multimedia uh, 95, where we, we had uh, three, three sound streams that were sent from different locations and all synchronized according to a synchronization protocol that allowed us to line up the timestamps in the data so that they were music that was all supposed to be played at the same time was played at the same time. The performers were both performing according to a to the third party third part that was recorded. So that was originated from one place, distributed to the two performers. They played their parts, and then all three of those came to a to a fourth place where it was all put back together. Uh, unfortunately, that synchronization work didn't uh, didn't ever become standardized. But I thought it was it was good work. Another aspect of the M-Bone that I should point out is that it didn't have any explicit uh, session control starting and stopping. The sessions were all multicast as well. The information about the sessions was multicast, so you, you had a little session directory program that listened to the session announcement protocol and collected a list of sessions that you could tune into and the sessions were basically organized by different multicast addresses. So it's like different channels that you could tune into. So that was a very loose form of conference control. And I'll talk more about the control aspects in a moment after talking about the development of RTP. Uh, the arrows in this diagram indicate not data flow or anything, but actually the evolutionary path of the protocols. It began with the network voice protocol that I had talked about earlier from our ARPANET and early internet work. Uh, from there, we picked up the notion of carrying a separate sequence number and timestamp, and I'll show that in a minute. And from the, the, the VAT program, uh, program and protocol, since for visual audio terminal was developed by Van Jacobson and Steve McCann at uh, LBL. Um, it had its own protocol, and it contributed a couple of notions like on-the-fly on the vocoding switching, uh, source identifiers when mixing together multiple sources, and a startup Toxpert bit for adjusting the time delay. So the headers are shown on each of this next sequence of slides to show the fairly simple aspects of the data protocols that we put together into RTP. As I mentioned, sequence number and timestamp are important together because the sequence number allows detecting when there are packets lost, and the timestamp, which tells what the position of each frame or packet should be, uh, allows you to distinguish between gaps that are due to losses and gaps that are intentional because of silence when we don't transmit anything. In NVP, we actually had a header checksum in place. We, we spent uh, seven bits on that um, header checksum because we wanted to be able to accommodate data paths where there might be some bit corruption in the data, which we could tolerate, but a bit error in the header 
would cause the packet to probably be unusable. Um, it turns out that there really aren't transports available that don't have some lower level mechanism that's going to kick out the packets if they have it anyway. So uh, we didn't actually carry that idea into RTP. In NVP, we did also carry the control tokens in the same uh, packets along with the data um, and uh, talk more about that separation in a moment. Um, and then a data length, this protocol was dependent on the, on the lower layer protocol to say what the overall length of the, the data was. In the VAT protocol, there was not both a, a timestamp and a sequence number, just a timestamp in audio samples. Um, the, the way that, that silences were indicated was by a flag on the first packet after silence that indicated that a gap had occurred. And so that was a suggestion of a time when the receiver could adjust its delay that it's putting in to accommodate the jitter to either increase it or decrease it according to how much delay had been built up. Uh, it also included a site identifier so that you could have pre-mixed audio, audio that had gone to one place, been mixed together and delivered on further, and still be able to tell who the sources were inside that audio. And it had a conference ID for validation that the packets you were receiving were ones that you actually intended to receive. We carried those, some of those notions over from NVP and and VAT protocol into the first version of RTP. Those of you working with RTP may have wondered why it's RTP version 2 and what happened to 0 and 1. Uh, the VAT protocol was actually allocated the 0 in the, in the first two bits is where the version number was, and VAT had 0 in that position. RTP version 1 had 1 in that position. In this version of the protocol, we used uh, timestamps carried as seconds, 16 bits of seconds and 16 bits of fraction, and had that timestamp rate be the same for all protocols, all data formats. Uh, the idea behind it was to allow simple intermediate synchronization that you wouldn't have to do timestamp calculations. Um, the, we had the sequence number and timestamp also present, as I said, to detect loss. And in this version of the protocol, we moved to uh, a flag at the end of a talk spurt or the end of a video frame to indicate a point when you knew you had something that was complete. That was more important for video because then without having to wait for the beginning of the next frame, you would know that that frame was complete and you could display it. Um, those were our motivations in making the change. Uh, we did still have the audio format uh, in each packet so you could switch on the fly. And um, we had the notion of carrying control tokens here in the data and a channel ID for multiplexing packets from different sources. Um, RTP version 1, I think, could have been workable. But there were influential people who uh, felt it had serious problems, and we got pushback from the IETF management to reconsider a couple of the, of the design aspects. And that led to RTP version 2. Here, a change was to be like that, to have the timestamp in samples. And the motivation there was so that you could do uh, positioning of the data with sample accuracy and positioning of the, of the data in time for playback uh, continuously with, sam with one sample accuracy, not worrying about uh, arithmetic errors that could be introduced by having to convert from a fixed timestamp rate into the native sample rate of the media. Uh, the the Toxpert flag was changed to be not the same for audio and video. Back to the beginning of a Toxpert for audio where it's more convenient and remained at the end for video. So that's the, the M bit up there, the marker bit in, in RTP. Still carried the, the, the format identifiers for switching on the fly and carried the source identifiers for, uh, for the audio that was pre-mixed so that you could tell um, 
could tell who was speaking when you were getting audio that was pre-mixed. The synchronization source identifier is uh, an application level source identification um, that served as a, a backup for validating packets to make sure they were ones that belonged in your stream. As you know, you could send IP packets anywhere and the receiver needs to be able to tell whether they're, uh, they're appropriate or not. Some of the philosophy in, uh, in RTP version 2 was to try to keep the control and data separate. The, the notion of control tokens was removed from, uh, from the data packets in RTP version 2 and a separate RTCP uh, control protocol was devised to carry those as separate packets, and I'll show that in a moment. Uh, we kept a fixed 12-byte header so that calculations were simple and so that it was easy to do header compression on it. You may have heard of RTP header compression, a couple of different kinds. And it, it was highly scalable. Multicast was a big influence in the design of RTP so that we could have it work well both for two-party conferences as well as conferences with thousands of users and not have the control traffic overwhelm the data traffic because of having so many participants sending control traffic. One other point is in the, in the uh, descriptions of jitter, for example, the, the time, uh, the, the measurements, of, or the, the, the packets which conveyed packet loss information, what the last sequence number was it received, et cetera, how many packets were received. Those were all carried as absolute values rather than incremental values. We didn't say I received uh, 60 packets since the last update. We say that we received a total of this many packets. And the reason for that is that if you lose a, one of those control packets carrying those numbers, it doesn't matter because you can still take a delta between any two packets that you did receive and find out how many were received during that time. Some of that philosophy uh, has, not, uh, has not been kept over time. Uh, there was always push to try to add more complexity into it to allow more, more features. Uh, and so in 2009, uh, the idea of keeping the, the, uh, the control and data separate was was it, the idea of keeping control data separate was important so that you could have, for example, some monitoring stations that just listened to the control traffic and didn't have to receive the data traffic as well. They could filter that out based on the separate addressing, separate port numbers being used for those two streams. However, with the introduction of, of NAT and with the introduction of, of uh, gateway units that, that were trying to to gateway a large number of streams, they ran out of port space per IP address. And so a, a new variation on RTP was introduced such that in some circumstances, the RTP and RTCP packets could be multiplexed back together. Also, we tried to keep options out of the header in RTP, but uh, we, we left a little hook in there for experimentation and that Pandora's box has now been opened and options are happening. Um, one other thing that surprised me was I thought that based on our early work with CBSD and LPC um, and then subsequent work in the early 90s on various coding algorithms that, that that work would kind of slow down. People would run out of ideas about what to do about compressing uh, audio and video. But that hasn't happened at all. This is a, a, a list of the different audio codecs that, for which there are uh, payload formats for RTP defined, and there are more added since this. Switching from the data side to the control side, um, there's, there are a number of aspects of the control protocols. NVP just scratched the surface of this with a fairly rudimentary uh, session setup mechanism. Um, we, did have, we did have tokens like ringing the telephone and getting an answer back, uh, that kind of control. 
for setting up the the point-to-point -point conferences, and then with NVCP, we uh, extended that to the extra controls for floor switching. Um, in RTP, the companion RTCP protocol um, supports only loosely controlled sessions. It's, it's really just conveying session information information. It's not about setting up sessions or, or billing or any of that. So for a complete solution, you really need a bunch more and the, the SIP protocol has been addressing that. I'll talk a little about each of those. For NVP, as I mentioned, we had a, a series of, of control tokens that you could send for not only establishing the session, but also negotiating what kind of vocoding would be used. At this time, we actually described the vocoding in a, as a whole collection of parameters with the thought that we would be sort of tweaking those parameters as we set up sessions and we wanted to negotiate. Uh, we, we learned that, in fact, that wasn't really useful. Uh, it, it changed to where you just have a single code point for a particular vocoding and, and you, you choose certain sets of, of codings, coding parameters to use. In RTCP, and Danny wanted me to point out this is not RTCP, it's RTCP. Um, has nothing to do with TCP. Except that it completes RTP to be a transport protocol. An important part of any transport protocol is, is managing uh, congestion, managing uh, the flow control over the network. So it provides feedback about loss of packets if you're suffering a lot of packet loss, that probably means that you have congestion in the network and you should either back off your rate or stop sending. So it's really important for RTCP to be implemented along with RTP. It doesn't always happen in the implementations, and that's a concern. Um, RTCP does carry a, a persistent, persist, excuse me, a persistent identifier for the source, the S source value that I mentioned that's carried in each RTP packet that's used for validation is just a random number. It's a random number so that when people initiate from different places independently, there's probability of collision is low. Here, this binds in, in the RTCP. We carry that S source value and a persistent identifier so that you can uh, get some meaning from it. In addition to providing feedback about the, the, what was lost, packets that were lost, it also allowed each user to, to learn, so it allowed each user to learn what losses other users had experienced, but it also allowed each user in a multicast session to know how many others there were. And based on that, the timers for repetition of the control packets, spacing with the control packets, automatically adjusted including some randomization to avoid synchronization so that we could accommodate with RTCP sessions of a wide variety of sizes. So this dealt with, with loosely controlled sessions. In order to have a, a more explicit session like a telephone call, then the session initiation protocol was developed, also in IETF. It drew on... Uh, on a number of uh, research projects that had gone before, either phone at Park and Turing Machine at Belcor, um, work we did it at ISI and CCP and, and the MMCOMP system at BBN. Um, I, I'm sure that most of you have heard of SIP by now because it has actually um, become fairly widely used. Uh, it, a lot of work was done there and still more work needs to be done. Um, the SIP concentrated on just point-to-point -point conferencing, deferring the multi-point explicit conferencing for later. So you may have wondered why we called the, this talk being about prehistory in the title. Really, because uh, voice over IP was only coined in 1995, a lot of people are unaware of the two decades that came before that. Um, Talking about the history part between 95 and now, there has been a lot of work done on the protocols, both continuing work on RTP and uh, continuing work on the control protocols to go with it. 
Um, it, RTP was adopted by, uh, by ITUT for the H323 method of setting up conferences and point-to-point -point calls. And SIP was developed, as I said, in IETF through quite a bit more work. And in conjunction with that, or, or in, it, in addition to it, the RTSP real-time streaming protocol was developed for control of, of, of more stream-oriented uh, playback uh, in, using RTP, typically. So my conclusion, which really is a conclusion for the two days of talks, not just my own, um, the, it's pretty clear, I think, to most everyone that, that packet audio and video are important components of the internet today. And the, the roots of that work were in what we did in the 70s, not only in uh, developing the concepts of how to deal with real-time data, uh, but also the protocol work directly fed into the protocols that we're using today. That work depended on advances in technology to make it practical, but it is now something that we are, are treating as a normal, everyday occurrence. So that's it. The, I have a couple of URLs here if you're interested in the movie. It is on YouTube, and it also you can get the, uh, the full MPEG 50 megabyte uh, original at this other location here. Questions? Yes? What type of video encoding did you use? So what we did, actually that was kind of interesting, at ISI we, oh yeah, what sort of video encodings we used. Um, at, at ISI we developed our own, uh, our own codec, um, which was based on, um, at that point the the DSPs, the, the, the Texas Instruments TI-320, um, TMS-320, had just been released. And we actually took eight of those and built a signal instruction multiple data architecture where we had eight of those DSP chips operating in parallel um, to do discrete cosine transform compression of the, of the video. Um, we didn't have a lot of processing power there, so what we did was we had um, another bit processor that looked over all the blocks. Uh, we used, I think, 16 by 16 blocks of the image to detect which ones had changed. And then we applied the DCT only to those that changed and transmitted those, uh, those blocks. And the rest stayed the same. Um, the, the algorithm. For, our, for determining which blocks had changed also didn't really have time to look at every pixel. It looked at the border of the block. And so if you were careful, you could toss a, uh, a, a wad of paper up in, and get it to, to freeze there because it would, it would be in the middle of a block and not detected when it left. It was kind of fun. But it was also very fast. It, it's, we sent 30 frames per second even at that time. So if you did like this, you could show your fingers accurately. But if you did like this, then there would the frame rate would slow down in order to, to accommodate those differences. Um, around that time, we also took a couple of commercial codecs, uh, PictureTel codec and um, uh, Compression Labs codec, which were not really designed for use over packet network. Even though they had block structures, they weren't designed for losses. Um, and we, we had ad adopted, adapted those those block structured data streams to be carried over the packet network. And as long as our packet loss was low enough, then they worked OK. Uh, there was another aspect of, of reconstructing clock at the other end, because they were designed to work over synchronous streams, T1 lines. Um, so we had to accommodate that, uh, that drift in the clock between the two ends. Other questions? So the question was whether uh, the various forms of, of audio that we have, uh, chat on computers and, and uh, uh, DCT phone, I think you were talking about a, a cordless phone, um, 
that's just the local communication technology under, underlying that might be voice over IP or whatever, and and the the cellular phone with a couple which which might have which might be using in your iPhone or or Android phone might be using the the carrier's own transport mechanism or could have a packet voice uh, application on it to to carry over. So are all those going to converge? I expect that. It, it will be ultimately all some form of packet-based communication. Whether there, whether we get to a point where there's one encoding that's used typically in all of them, so that it could be end-to-end, -end, no matter what sort of uh, devices came in the middle. It, given the the proliferation of different encodings, I I, I don't see that happening. But I I do think we're converging towards packets as the transport mechanism underneath. Yes. ITU came up with the H three. How do we end up with two? So right, ITU T came up with H three two three, and ITF came up independently with SIP. Why really? Why did we have two? Why did? I guess the one way to phrase that question would be: Why was SIP created if if ITU T had done H three two three already? And uh, I'm on the ITF side, so I'm going to have a biased view. Uh, H323 was terribly complicated. Um, and I think, in part, SIP was a reaction to that. Um, the H323 came out of H320, which was a synchronous protocol. So it evolved in ITUT from, from a synchronous protocol to a packet protocol. And because of that, it carried over some of the constraints from the circuit-based system and, and models of how things should operate from that system, which didn't fit completely with the packet-based view. So SIP came from the other direction, from loosely controlled conferencing and saying, OK, what do we, you know, what's the minimum we can add to this to allow sessions to be more explicitly controlled? So um, different people with different perspectives and different goals, and, and that's how it came about. Um, I think SIP has uh, expanded beyond 323 uh, as far as the deployment these days. So apparently the, the more internet packet-centric view uh, is the winner. Questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you.